Thanks, Peter and, and Mitch <clears throat> for the invitation and honor to present in a, a symposium uh, named in Bob's honor. So, uh, you know, my, my convention is to uh, receive a title from organizers, not ask what they mean by that title, and then just try to see if I can fit uh, some data uh, un under that umbrella. So, so blame Peter and Mitch for the uh, inscrutable title, um, but ho hopefully I'll, I'll make some uh, clarifying comments. Um, I'm going to move fast. Um, I, I, I'm capable of talking very fast, and I'm going to leverage that today. Uh, much of, well, all the data I'm showing you today um, has been presented in some form or another. You're welcome to have my slides, and you're welcome to come grab me um, uh, after this uh, session or any other time, and I'll give you your own personal version of the talk if you need me to slow down. Uh, disclosures are shown here, very long list, but um, not particularly pertinent to today's topic. Okay, so let me just set the stage um, for what I'm going to uh, try to wrestle down over just a few minutes. Um, so really, um, the, the, the alternate title of this talk is, is there any hope of finding needles in haystacks if we perform uh, uh, high dimensional uh, data uh, generation exercises on tumor samples, as I'll focus on today, um, in relatively small numbers of patients. And I'm going to just tell you a, just a couple of um, a very brief stories that, at least in my mind, suggest, in fact, that yes, um, that if we scale out to genome-wide uh, analyses, that in fact we can get down to um, individual actionable markers. I'm going to use my favorite disease state, melanoma, um, and in this case, immunotherapy um, outcomes as the, uh, the context, because there's a, been a rich um, data stream uh, generated here. So uh, you're all familiar with uh, the benefit uh, observed with immunotherapy in various um, solid tumor settings. Here's melanoma data. I'm going to really focus your attention on the blue curve, which is nivolumab PD-1 monotherapy, um, which is uh, a, a very active treatment and with uh, quite an acceptable toxicity profile. Unfortunately, 40 percent of patients are de novo refractory. 60 percent of patients have stable or responding disease. Um, and you see that uh, from this about 60 percent level, about half of that population will ultimately lose control of their disease over subsequent years of follow-up. Um, the analyses that I'm going to show you today have really been focused on trying to sort this initial 40 percent drop-off, um, the de novo refractory patients, from the patients who have some degree of disease control. Um, I would argue, in fact, that with later analyses, uh, more mature data sets, what we really care about are these uh, patients who get really, really long-term benefit. Um, the vast majority of them have no evidence of disease, um, convincing evidence of disease if they make it out to this five-year time point and beyond. Um, but we haven't, we haven't trained our analyses as yet um, to really parse out this subpopulation from the ones who have uh, a significant degree of tumor control but not permanent. You've all seen uh, some representation of this data. I've adapted this um, famous slide uh, just to highlight the association between tumor mutation burden and PD-1, PD-L1 antibody FDA approvals. So quite a striking association. And I'm sure you're all aware of various um, sources of data that support this association between predicted or truly observed mutated neoantigens for which there is, in fact, even a T-cell receptor demonstrated in um, an individual patient. Uh, this is some of the early data that made the association between clonal mutated neoantigens and clinical benefit from PD-1 or CTLA-4 antibody therapy in a mixed melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer cohort. Um, but the association, while um, interesting and striking and supportive of the notion that you really needed to have clonality or representation of this mutated new antigen in nearly all cells, if not all cells, in the tumor um, to associate with response, it's kind of unsatisfying data when you consider that you've got outliers like this with 600 mutated neoantigens, when we can pretty well predict that not all of those mutated neoantigens are being seen by TCRs that are the drivers of the tumor clearing event um, in response to an immune checkpoint antibody. You've got patients down here who've got relatively modest number of mutated neoantigens and yet have um, excellent clinical benefit. So um, there's needle and haystack phenomenon here that I'm just going to briefly um, kind of wrap up with because this is quite an incomplete story to turn around and try to do whole exome sequencing in patients prospectively, nominate mutated neoantigens that we might then use for therapeutic purpose here with uh, a vaccine approach, um, or uh, imagine uh, arming a CAR T cell uh, with a TCR that could recognize a mutated neoantigen, which um, is being uh, schemed as we speak. Um, this is, um, I would say, 
an exercise that uh, is difficult to judge in terms of how, how, how ready it is for prime time given that we really don't understand the numerator and denominator problem here yet in terms of all potentially uh, recognized mutated new antigens and the ones that actually um, could use a boost, if you will, with either a vaccination approach or, as I suggested, a, a cell therapy approach. Nonetheless, there's some intriguing early data that suggests that you can get immune responses uh, by uh, attempting to immunize uh, with peptides that uh, encode these uh, mutated new antigens. Um, it is based on a, um, a, a bit of a leap of faith hypothesis, which I'll just summarize very briefly to say that, uh, as, as depicted here, the notion is that if you have patient-specific um, uh, antigens, in, in this case mutated neoantigens, uh, that there may not be tolerance to those antigens. But of course the challenge of that is that these mutated neoantigens existed throughout the entire life cycle and evolution of this cancer. So in fact tolerance to a degree um, in fact has been observed in this setting. So breaking tolerance uh, just by vaccinating alone or adding a PD-1 antibody to that um, uh, may or may not uh, actually overcome uh, uh, that that uh, the tolerance that has been acquired. We'll see, Our early days, um, and we're uh, awaiting much more clinical validation of this concept. Let me swing over into this immune profiling uh, 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 area for a moment, which is gonna be discussed in a later talk um, in, a, in a different context. Just to say that there's a fairly overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that if there is a population of immune cells, and particularly T cells, present in the tumor prior to the initiation of treatment. So there's already tumor-immune interaction occurring, uh, but of course this is in settings where the tumor is winning um, and advanced disease has been established. Um, it's very clear that if you start to look at um, measures of immune infiltration in a tumor, you can get some response prediction. And that's been done in relatively small data sets. This is, again, melanoma data, um, where uh, even maybe more so than other tumor types, we find that PDL1 expression is quite an unsatisfying biomarker, not completely useless, um, but not very uh, capable of uh, segregating response, non response outcomes. Uh, infiltration of CD8s, in fact, is a little bit better than that. And based on this data set, if you look at a marker of activation on top of the infiltrating CD8 uh, cells, that's where you get far better discrimination. It was following this observation that we reasoned it might be reasonable to try to um, really broaden the search for markers of the immune cell type or the immune cell state um, that associated with response and non-response, really building on this lower resolution analysis. So we, we have been over years subjecting uh, patients who uh, volunteer to undergo research biopsies before, during, um, and for patients who respond and lose response after treatment. Uh, in this case, melanoma patients receiving immune checkpoint antibody therapy. Um, and we've accumulated, uh, by the time of this analysis uh, published uh, just uh, last year, a few dozen patients who've had serial uh, biopsies procured and subjected to single cell RNA sequencing, which is the ultimate explosion in terms of um, high dimensional data. Um, and perhaps you would uh, think that if you were looking at a, a cohort of patients um, of responders and non-responders uh, totaling uh, 37 as shown here, there'd be no way that you could actually uh, pull needles out of uh, such a haystack when you start generating um, single cell RNA sequencing data. These are the uh, signatures of the immune cell populations that one can pull out of a single core uh, needle uh, in these cases. And, and really strikingly, even before we got out to three dozen patients, even after about a dozen patients, you could start to see a segregation within the CD8 positive T cell population um, labeled here as G and B, good versus bad. Um, so literally those uh, CD8 positive T cells that when they were present and predominant associated with good clinical outcome or response to therapy uh, versus non-response if the bad cells predominated. And that's what's depicted here, literally just the, the ratio, the very simple ratio of good cells over bad cells associating with response. And with response prediction, that was actually far better than we observed with PDL1 or CD8 um, infiltration in, uh, or the two combined. Um, if we then adjusted for loss of uh, MHC complex uh, presentation uh, through beta 2 microglobulin mutation, um, so that simple additional genetic feature, we could get to really excellent um, outcome prediction with just this simple uh, measure. Now it turns out that there was a transcription factor in this signature that was itself the most predictive. This was uh, TCF7. And so then we circle back to simple immunofluorescence in this case, but subsequently immunistic chemistry. We can in fact pick out the CDA positive T cells that were TCF7 positive, which was the single transcription factor that, that um, marked this good cell population. And you could find examples of, of a robust infiltrating uh, a subpopulation of CD8s shown in green 
that had a lot of TCF7 shown in red uh, versus cases here where you had plenty of CD8s but not very many of them that were TCF7s and positive. So these would be predicted responders, predicted non-responders. These, in fact, this isn't, these are individual cases that truly were responder and non-responder uh, patients. And using just that ratio, TCF7 positive CD8s um, uh, over the negative, so the good over bad ratio, but now reduced to a single biomarker, we were able to maintain the same robustness of response prediction that we were able to achieve with this you know, massive scale of single cell RNA sequencing data. So suggesting, in fact, that if we launch this exercise that admittedly is not portable, you can't really do single cell RNA sequencing in routine clinical practice. It takes an incredible um, effort in terms of um, pre-analytic processing, um, anal compulsion, and very rapid um, handling and processing of these specimens. But certainly, immunized to chemistry for a single marker is something that can be uh, portabilized uh, uh, more broadly. So it turns out that the entire um, response prediction signature um, is not coming from just the immune compartment um, based on other data uh, that has emerged, uh, and that is doing single cell RNA sequencing of the tumor cell population. Now we have in the data set that I just showed you before tumor transcript data. We just haven't yet presented and published it, uh, but what I'm going to show you is independent data that we generated initially in BRAF MEK treated melanoma patients, so targeted therapy treated patients. And doing, in that case, uh, initially bulk RNA sequencing and then single cell RNA sequencing out of, again, that massive scale of data, uh, what we were able to pull out uh, was a subpopulation of um, tumor cells that in some patients' tumors, these are individual patients' uh, metastatic lesions, the predominant cell population was this so-called MITF low axle high. Uh, subpopulation of cells. MITF is a transcription factor that determines the differentiation of the melanocyte lineage from the neural crest. Um, so cells like this we refer to as dedifferentiated and neural crest-like. In fact, they do have neural crest markers. Um, and in the braf mec inhibitor-treated cohort analysis, these were patients who were non-responsive to uh, braf mec therapy. Um, and then the more common scenario is patients who have better differentiated uh, melanocyte-like uh, melanomas uh, shown here, and these uh, based on in vitro and then clinical data are uh, patients who will respond better. You do see in individual patients, unfortunately, this distribution, which in fact, this heterogeneity, which you would uh, likely predict could occur. Um, so you have a patient here whose tumor cells are mostly differentiated. They'd be predicted responders, but there's this troubling subpopulation of cells that would be predicted to survive um, the uh, initial therapy. Um, what's been fascinating as more data has matured from this analysis and others as well is that when you now look at this uh, transcriptional state, this dedifferentiated cell state um, that has the same somatic mutation makeup uh, as uh, the better differentiated cells within a mixed population, um, this overlaps quite nicely with um, immune recognition. So the immunologically cold tumors are these dedifferentiated tumors. The better differentiated tumors are the ones that are actually uh, quite well T cell inflamed, um, this based on TCGA data. Um, and this turns out to actually associate with response and non-response to PD-1 antibody therapy. Uh, so this is a 28 patient cohort uh, from UCLA. Uh, responders, non-responders, the immune markers in this analysis actually were really weakly predictive of outcome. It was the tumor-derived transcripts and axel, which is that, that part of that uh, two-component signature, MITF low, axel high, was the single best discriminator of response, non-response. So the notion that, that uh, tumor-immune interactions have a, um, a uh, origin, if you will, from the tumor cell is not only supported by this somatic genetic mutated new antigen story, but even um, uh, tumor cell states. So I'll conclude by saying that uh, some early runs in relatively small cohorts at generating very large scale data um, in the immune, uh, infiltrating immune cell compartment and in the tumor cell compartment have already given us um, some pretty profound signals of being able to discriminate between those patients who are able to derive deep and durable responses versus those patients who cannot. Um, now, how portable this type of analysis is to other tumor contexts, and when you're giving um, complex regimens, so chemotherapy PD-1 combination treatment, for example, to be determined in future analyses, but this is the type of work that we would like to extend across uh, all tumor types. Um, in ECOG, ECOG Akron studies, which we can discuss later. Thank you.